everyone, and welcome to Configuration Management in Drupal for Beginners. This is a session that I am particularly excited about and passionate about because it marked a time in my life as a uh, Drupal site builder, as a Drupal developer uh, of growth. Because prior to configuration management, I had to do a lot of configuration on my Drupal site more than once, or I had to do the work directly in the live environment, which everybody should know is a very bad idea. It's very risky. It's a little bit dangerous. So configuration management was important to me because it allowed me to do my work once. It allowed me to move that configuration from one environment, from staging to live or from local to live, and not have to do it multiple times or risk doing it directly on the live site. So let's actually start by going through an introduction of what configuration management is generally and what the problem is and maybe even some solutions. First, hello everyone. My name is David Needham. I'm a developer advocate at Pantheon. I'm based out of Champaign, Illinois, which is just a couple hours south of Chicago, Illinois in the United States. Um, I, uh, as a developer advocate, I spend a fair bit of time presenting at conferences just like this all over the world. Uh, I spend a lot of time working on our training materials. So I spend a lot of time creating new workshops at Pantheon, uh, taking everything that I learn, being an employee here and kind of volunteer in the community. Uh, I go out and present and help organize camps and conferences and other training workshops. That's what I'm most excited about. So. With the introduction out of the way, uh, if you'd like to grab my slides or anything like that, you can go to my website, davidneedham.me slash DCEU2020. You can grab the slides and I'll, I'll have that link at the end of the presentation as well. So let's talk about the anatomy of a content management system. So this is not specifically, you know, just Drupal. This is relevant for pretty much any content management system that I'm aware of. But as you're going through and creating your content management system or interacting with it, you know, kind of fleshing it out and building your site, it's made up of three parts. There's code, which in Drupal makes up the modules, the themes, basically any of the code that you're modifying to make your website a little bit special. There's also configuration, which in Drupal refers to content types, you have fields on those content types, there's views, there's all sorts of things that you're changing as part of your configuration on your site. And then there's also content, which maybe is self-explanatory, but that's your blog posts. If you have a store, it might be products. You might have individual user accounts, customers, things like that. Um, all of that is counted as content. And when you start trying to export your site, you know, maybe you're in Drush, you do a Drush archive dump. Uh, maybe you're working locally, you wanna get it up to your production site. Uh, you know, there's lots of reasons why you might want to export your site, but it, the export is, is made up of three parts. There's code, there's the database, and there's the files. Now, how do these actually map to each other? Well, the code goes to code, of course, but the configuration goes to the database. Drupal is actively reading your configuration changes directly from the database. Whenever you make a configuration change, it is getting saved to the database. Uh, and you know that's, that's how it's all being saved. When you export it, you grab a copy of the database so that you get all of that configuration. But the problem is that your content is also being saved in the database. You're stuck because you can't overwrite the live database because that would overwrite the content. And if people are actively adding content on your live site or buying things from a store or leaving comments on your website, you're, you're kind of stuck a little bit. So you, you, you can't overwrite the database. And then also content is writing to files, which in Drupal, you, know, you upload an image or a PDF that gets saved in the files directory. It's that sort of thing. So as we start looking at a uh, sort of modern development workflow, we have three environments. There's development or dev, there's test, and there's live. Now you're actively doing your work in the dev environment. Uh, that's where you're doing your code. That's where you're building out new functionality, maybe applying security updates and all of that stuff. The live environment is where people are interacting with your site directly, buying things from that store, leaving those comments, things like that. And then the test environment becomes a safe place where those two things can come together 
so that you can experiment and make sure that your site changes that you're making are not going to break the live site before you actually deploy to live. So the way that this works, and you know, it's no coincidence that this is what Pantheon does. You know, Pantheon provides this workflow out of the box, but this is the best practice workflow I learned about before Pantheon even existed as a company. So this should be something that you can get set up regardless of you know, if you're on Pantheon or somewhere else. But uh, as part of this workflow going through, you're doing your work in dev, your you know, live stuff is happening in live, you are syncing your files and database down from the test environment. You're effectively rebuilding the test environment pretty regularly as a copy of live because you want to make sure that any changes you're making, uh, if there's a problem with it, it's going to break the test site, not the live site. So when our development work is done, we deploy that code up to our test environment. Because test is a fresh copy of live, it should be the exact same situation. We, we know it's going to happen before we actually risk deploying to live. And so we have a chance to test. We have a chance to make sure you know, that it's not going to cause any unexpected side effects. And when we're confident that all of our code changes, all of our you know, improvements that we're making to the site are not actually going to break anything, then we can safely deploy that up to the live environment and then you know, make a copy, you know, rebuild our dev dev sites that we're developing against a, a recent copy of live. And this is great. This workflow is sort of the, the best practice way of doing this sort of thing. And that is wonderful. This was a huge improvement over the sorts of development that I did prior to this. However, what about configuration? Well, in this workflow, when you are doing active configuration, you might recall, you know, configuration gets saved into the database. But the database, it starts in the live environment and it goes down. It only goes to, you know, to the test. It always goes down to the development environment. And that's because we don't want to overwrite the database on live. We don't want to lose that content there. And so that's a problem. It means that when we do configuration as part of this workflow, we're doing it in dev because we don't want to um, make configuration changes on live. That's very risky. So we do it in dev, but then we have to do it again in test, and then we have to do it again in live. We have to rebuild our configuration multiple times. That's not really good. That's, that's demoralizing. People don't like to do the same work more than once, or at least I certainly don't like to do the same work more than once. Also, the more times that you have to redo something like that, the more likely it is that you're going to make a mistake. You're not going to do it exactly the same way that you did in dev. And as part of this, you start to ask yourself like, well, do we really need the test environment? Is, do we really need to test again? Because I really don't want, I, I, I don't want to do it one more time, let alone doing it two more times. I don't have to rebuild that configuration so many more times. And so you start to get a little bit lazy. You start to not test as thoroughly as you should, which results in mistakes. It results in problems on your live production website, which nobody wants. So what's the solution to this? Well, let's take a look at this chart again. You know, configuration as part of this standard practice gets saved into the database. But with configuration management built within Drupal core, configuration gets moved over to code. All of your configuration can be exported into code so that it moves through that workflow in a way that is easy for you to manage. And it means that you don't have to recreate your work. So if we take a look at how configuration management works um, you know, on your Drupal site, well, let's say you're going along, you have your development environment or maybe your local environment, if that's how you work, you make changes. You are building out a new content type with new fields. You're adding some new functionality, you're making changes. Throughout that process, all of that change is getting saved in the database. And so when you're ready to go, you can export that database configuration into code. And then when you're ready to move it to the test environment, you can you know, deploy it to your, your staging site, your test site, whatever your workflow might consist of. And then you import configuration from code into the database. Because again, Drupal is reading from the database. So, the code allows us to move it safely from one space to the next. And then we are always interacting with the database so that that is where Drupal is actively reading from. So if we take a look at that development workflow again, but this time with configuration management, we still have dev test and live, but this time 
throughout our development cycle, throughout our process, we are actively exporting configuration. We're, we're making changes to the dev site or the local site, but throughout the time we are exporting from the database into code. And we might do that multiple times. We might have multiple commits associated with that, with the, the various changes that we're making to our site. And then, you know, the, the rest of the process is pretty similar. We sync our files and database down from the live environment. We're rebuilding the test environment, making a you know copy of lives so that we're working and testing against a site that's a, a representation of our live environment. We deploy our code, which in this case includes our configuration. So we can then import our configuration into our test environment. Again, go through and test, make sure that everything's working, try to break it. If everything works well and there are no surprises, we can then confidently deploy that up to the live, and live environment and import our configuration there. And we know we're not gonna have any surprises. We're not gonna have any uh, thing break as the result of importing this configuration because we've already done that in the test environment. And this process works much better. So let's talk briefly about the benefits of configuration management. So first of all, you get to move your configuration along with your module. So if you are adding a new module to add some new piece of functionality, uh, you of course are configuring your site along with that, you're able to export the configuration associated with that module along with that. So it, it's a little bit more tidy, the commits, the deployments can make a little bit more sense because you're uh, kind of bundling them together. You don't have a bunch of random stuff, you know, in a database dump here and your you know, code there and things like that. Also, you get to version control your configuration, which is huge for two different reasons. The first one is that you get to see who changed configuration on your website. How often have you wondered who changed this particular section of the site or who made a uh, an edit that broke this particular thing? Well, with version controlled configuration, you're able to see that. Also, if someone did break something or if you want to go back, you can revert configuration, not just code, but because configuration gets saved into code, you're able to revert that and then re-import. So you can undo configuration over time. Another benefit is that you get to rebuild the development environment whenever you want. This might seem like a minor thing, but developing, actively developing against the most recent, most active version of your live site can have very positive implications. Because if you are actively developing a module or you're actively building out some new part of the site, while at the same time, your content creators or your customers are doing interesting big things on the live environment, as a traditional sort of like water flow stack of development where you have to get everything done before you can deploy. It means that you might deploy something that is not quite lining up with what has changed on the live site. This, this way, working with configuration management is much more agile. You're able to actively sync your development environment with a copy from live at any point and then just re-import all the configuration changes you've made. It means that you can sync up your development site or your local site with a copy of live anytime that you want. And you'll always get up to date. You can continue developing and then be on your way. You don't get stuck with those awkward sort of mismatches. And then finally, you can also automate your imports with Drush. And we'll talk about this in just a minute, but Drush, the Drupal shell, you're able to interact on the command line with your site and import and export your configuration. But there are some gotchas to configuration management. It is worth noting that config management only works to and from the same site. And this is intentional. Um, I, I mentioned you can grab my slides. I'll have a link to the slides at the end. But there is a great talk at DrupalCon Austin, I believe, where the team behind configuration management talked about this specifically, shared their kind of logic behind it. And there's more information there if you want to learn more. Also it's very important that you communicate with your team that you are using configuration management and that they understand how configuration management works. And the reason for this is because you are actively importing, exporting configuration. You are deploying to a new site, sometimes to the live site and importing configuration, which is changing the way that people's configuration works. It means that they could have changes on live that are actively being overwritten. Now, nobody likes to do work more than once. 
absolutely nobody likes to have their changes undone uh, uh, accidentally. They don't like their work to be lost. So it's very important that they understand that configuration should not be happening in live, that you should be doing this in the dev site or your locally or whatever workflow it is that you have. It's just important that they understand that their work, their configuration could be overwritten unless they go through the proper workflow. Now, another thing is that there are some areas to Drupal that are a little bit ambiguous. Um, blocks, for example, or taxonomy, uh, the menu system in some cases, are those content or are those configuration? Well, you know, if you have a block that you put on the sidebar of your site and the text pretty much never changes, if, if it's always you know, a welcome message to your site or, or something like that, that's probably configuration but if you have a block that is actively regularly changing out with new content and new things, and maybe it's different on every page, or that could be seen as content. Um, it's a little ambiguous. The configuration management system within Drupal doesn't know what to do with that by default, but there are some modules that you can add to define, to say, this is configuration, this should be exported and imported. Um, so there, there are ways around this, but it's worth remembering that there are some areas that are a little bit ambiguous that might not export automatically the way you'd expect it to. Now, speaking of extra modules, there are some ways to extend this process and go a little bit further. There is the config direct save module. Um, this module makes the configura configuration management system work the way that I personally would expect it to work. By default, when you go to export configuration on a site, it will ask you to download a zip of the YAML files. You have to download it to your computer. And it's awkward because if you then want to import the configuration to your site, if you want to show up in the, uh, in the correct folder on your site so you can actually commit it and deploy it and go through that process, you then have to upload that zip. So you, you download a zip and then you upload a zip it's kind of weird. It, it, I, I'm surprised that it works that way by default. Config direct save will give you a button so that all you have to do is click save and it will actually write the configuration directly to the config directory on your site instead of having to download and upload and do that sort of awkward dance. There's another module that I recommend called uh, configuration read only mode. This will make it so that your uh, site builders, your uh, maybe customers that are using your site do not have access to change configuration that could be overwritten by an import. This is important because it will sort of lock down the configuration of your live environment, making it so that people don't have sad, unexpected consequences to, you know, I made some change, you didn't import, now all of my changes are lost. Configuration read only mode will make it so it's read only. They cannot make a configuration change unless you allow them to and maybe you know, educate them at that point about your workflow so that they know the right way to do it so that their changes are not lost. And then another one here is config ignore. Um, in many cases, you have modules that you have enabled on the development environment or on your local environment that you don't want to carry over to production. You know, one great example is maybe uh, the views UI module. The best practice in Drupal says that you don't typically have those UI modules enabled on production on live uh, for performance reasons, but also so that you don't have people accidentally making configuration changes on live. So you would probably have those enabled locally or on your development environment. You don't have them enabled on live and you are set up to accidentally enable them on live by exporting your configuration on, on dev, importing it there. Uh, you're very likely to make a mistake and accidentally have some configuration end up on live that you didn't want. Well, config ignore will let you define specific things and say, I don't want these changes to be exported. Just ignore them completely. That way, any changes that I make to this section on my, uh, my dev site won't end up on live. And then there's also the config split module. And I'm not going to get too much into this, but it allows for more advanced scenarios with using configuration management. So uh, you can dig more into these. Again, you can get links to these uh, in the slides at the end. Now, I did mention Drush and automation and things like that. Well, here are the Drush commands if you want to do a config import and export. And this is what the workflow looks like when you're going through and using Drush. And if you can automate, if you can uh, kind of speed that up, it works even better. The key difference here is that the deploy code 
and import config is one step. Uh, on Pantheon, we have a tool named Quicksilver that lets you run scripts alongside any active workflow on Pantheon. So we have a script, you can write a script, it just uses a drush config import to automatically, every time that you deploy to test or deploy to live, it does a config import automatically. This means you don't have to think about or remember to do that yourself, but it also means that the other people on your team don't have to remember to do it. They don't have to understand configuration management or know all the ins and outs or remember to do a drush config import. It just happens every time that they deploy to test or to live. And so, you know, Quicksilver, it's a Pantheon thing, but you know, you can probably write scripts like that for just about any hosting platform you have out there. So it's not really specific to Pantheon. But the important takeaway from this is that while this makes it easier for your team, it makes it more convenient for you, it's also an important, if not essential part for actually automating testing. If you want to have a visual regression test or a unit test or a B hat test that runs automatically whenever you deploy to your test environment, you cannot do that if you don't have your configuration be imported. Basically, if, you're, if your configuration is still hanging out in a config file and it's not being imported when you deploy to test, any automated tests that run automatically are not going to incorporate all of the configuration changes you've made, making them kind of useless, if not dangerous, because they're not representing the changes you're making. So you have to automate the configuration import if you want to automate the automated testing piece. So it's maybe a minor part for a, a basic a sort of beginner session, but it is an important part to include if you are doing that sort of thing. All right, so we have about 20 minutes. I'm gonna go through a, a quick live demo. Uh, for this workshop, I'm actually joined by a uh, friend of mine. He is Mr. Jenkins. He is the editor of Umami Magazine. One moment, I'm gonna go and get him real quick. So something that's kind of funny Mr. Jenkins is a little bit particular. Uh, he asked for a green room and, you know, obviously we're doing this from home. I didn't have a green room. Um, so I had to sort of go out and get some paint. I had to find a room in my house and paint it green for him. He's, like I said, very, very particular, but he's a good friend. So I think it's probably worth it, but okay, here we go. You got the stage, Mr. Jenkins. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Mr. Jenkins. And as David said, I am the editor in chief of Umami magazine. Now, I'm joined here today to show you how we at Umami actually create articles on our website. I, I think it would be um, an important thing to show today as we are demonstrating how to share content. We're going through with DrupalCon Europe. I'm very excited to be presenting today. Now we have umami, we, we share recipes, we share food articles, uh, very important. Now uh, to create a new article, I go up to content on my site, the umami food magazine website. Now we have all of this content here already. I have a, a new article that we wrote about oatmeal. Uh, I, I personally love oatmeal. I, I eat it for, for every breakfast, every single day. It's a very hearty meal. Oops, not recipe. I'm sorry. I need to add a article. All right, so let's go in and create an article. This is eat more oatmeal. Now we have the rest of the article that has been created. Uh, I, I wrote this in advance and since I am the the editor of Umami, I am able to publish this myself. I don't have to go through moderation. Um, but let's go ahead and add an image to this first. I'm going to add media. I'm going to find the oatmeal image that we created. And I'm going to save as publish and click save. 
Here is our lovely article about oatmeal and it looks perfect to me and we should see it appear on the articles page. <sighs> hmm. It does appear on the articles page, but we have more articles than just the one. Uh, if I go to the content page, I can confirm, yes, we have many articles that should be appearing. We, we, we have many more than just one article. <sighs> this does happen from time to time. Uh, one moment, I'm going to call uh, my, our, our developer, uh, Kyle. Uh, Kyle is very helpful for, for situations like this. One moment while I call Kyle. Hello, Kyle. Yep, I uh, am presenting at DrupalCon and uh, something happened. I need you to come and take a look at the, the website. Can you, can you come and look? Okay, thank you. Well, howdy folks, my name is Kyle and I am very excited to be here today to present at DrupalCon Europe. All right, so uh, Mr. Jenkins contacted me. He's the editor of Umami Magazine and he said that he's seen a problem on the live version of our website and I can see he is right. Uh, we definitely have more than just the one article. Um, well, let me jump over to my, my Pantheon dashboard and take a look. So, uh, you know, if you don't have Pantheon, it's okay. This is not necessarily a Pantheon specific thing, but it is really good to see visually what's going on. So that's what we're using. That's what we use for, for production on our site anyway. Now I have the dev site right here. Uh, and, you know, I confirmed with Mr. Jenkins that that is not working properly. Now let me open up my my development environment and see if that one is also not working correctly. Now, if I click on that link there, I'm going to go to the dev site. If I click on articles, I should see there should be lots of articles there, but no, indeed, I, I don't see Mr. Jenkins newest article, which is expected because we're on a different environment, but I also only see one article and that's, that's not right. We should, we should fix this. So, well, um, Let's see what we can do about that. Let's uh, let's take a look at the view. Uh, I was doing some stuff with views earlier in the year and uh, maybe I forgot to do this correctly, but let me go in and edit the view. Oh yeah, here we go. So it says display a specified number of items and I see one item. Now that is not correct. Uh, we should be putting this on, uh, let's say mini pager. Uh, page output mini pager. I'll click apply. Uh, number of items per page. Let's put this on six and click apply. All right, now let me click save and we'll see if this actually looks the way we expect it to. So here we go. We got the articles page. We got six articles. We got a pager at the bottom. I think this is good to go. So as part of my development workflow, uh, I need to export my configuration in this environment so that I can move it through code up to our test environment. We always test all of our changes. Uh, so let me go ahead and give that a try. Uh, I'm gonna go through the Drupal UI to do this. I, I could use Drush, but I'm gonna go through the configuration page. We can take a look at the configuration synchronization uh, from here, it will show me what's in the database and what's changed from the database versus what is actually in the code. And I can see right here, there is one change in this views view featured articles, which is that article section of our site. Now, if I click on view differences, it's actually going to show me a git diff so that I can compare. And I, I see, yep, so uh, right now in uh, stage, meaning in code, in what we exported previously, we have uh, items per page one. And in the database right now, because we just made the change to this on our Drupal site, we have uh, items per page six. Now this looks great. This is exactly what we wanted. So I'm going to take this and actually update. So Drupal does this cool thing. The configuration management system is very, very cool. But uh, by default, you have to export your configuration, which will generate a, 
uh, a gzipped tar file, which is which is good. Uh, but then if I want to update the code that I have on the site, I have to then go in and immediately import it, which is a little bit awkward, right? Well, there's this great module called config direct save, which we're using in this case. And I can just come in here, I can say sync, update configuration. And what this is gonna do is actually update our configuration file. It, it goes and writes it to the code directory. So if I uh, have done this, everything looks good. Now, if I go back to my Pantheon dashboard, I can uh, go in here. I should be able to see, oops, actually, I made a little mistake. I need to be in SFTP mode to make on-server uh, code changes to our site. Little mistake on my part, apologies. Uh, so back over on our site here, we can see that there are you know the different ways and I should be able to see still, um, there's still this change made right here. And that's because I did not have my environment set up to allow me to write to it just yet. And so that will be fixed in just a moment. Just gotta wait for this switch over to happen so we can make code changes directly in development. Now, if you're working locally, it's not gonna be a problem for you at all. Um, so what we're gonna see in just a minute is we're going to sync up our uh, configuration change with the recent content change that Mr. Jenkins made up in the live environment so that we can test it in our test environment. And that is going to let us to uh, make sure that we don't have any unexpected changes associated with this configuration change. Now, admittedly, I should probably set up some kind of uh, automated test because if I had a visual regression test in place, uh, this mistake probably wouldn't have happened because I would have noticed immediately that the um, there was a problem on the test environment if uh, we didn't have the right number of articles there. That would have been something easy to fix if I had had that set up. So I can see now in our, our uh, Pantheon dashboard in my development environment, I can see there is one file change ready to commit and I can see that it is that View, view, views view featured article section. And I can see that it is changing from one to six. So that is good to go. Now I just need to commit that. We're gonna say fixing the, oh, fixing the articles. Page. And I'm gonna click on commit. So this is committing this change with Git uh, on our development environment, which will then allow us to deploy that up to our test environment. Now, uh, if you are working locally, you just do git commit commands, or if you're using a Git app, then you would probably just use whatever you're familiar with uh, interacting with it there. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a git commit here in our uh, test environment. I'm going to pull files and database from the live environment. Again, this is something that Pantheon does automatically is uh, sync up the live environment with test, rebuilds it so that you don't have to do that yourself. But this is absolutely something you could do on your own computer or with whatever uh, hosting environment you might be using already. So if I do a deploy log message, I'm just going to put in uh, fixing articles page and click on deploy code. Now, after a, a moment, it's going to take a moment for this workflow to kick in. Now, I, I do not have Drush automatically importing in this environment, which means uh, I'm going to have to import this manually. Not a big deal, but I just need to wait for this workflow to complete this deployment to the test environment. And then I will be able to import configuration. We'll, we'll see how that works. And then we can... Uh, just verify that the configuration change worked and we uh, have the new content from Mr. Jenkins as well. So it'll just take a moment for this to complete. Now I can close my development URL. I don't need that anymore. And let me go ahead and open up my test. Actually, let me wait for this configuration, the, the workflow to complete, and then I will click the link here to open our site. 
All right, looks like we have about 10 more minutes left of this presentation. So if you have not had a chance to ask a question yet, please throw that into the uh, live Q&A. Uh, my, my colleague or David's colleague, John, is, uh, is on the line and able to kind of help facilitate some questions. Uh, we will leave some time for questions at the end as well. And, and John, if you have any questions to throw into Slack, feel free to uh, start putting them in there and David will be able to get to those in just a moment. All right, let me just refresh my site. Let's just take a look and see if this synchronization has completed yet. All right, it looks like that deployment has completed. So now I can go into site admin for this site. I can see it's the test environment because it starts with test. And now I'm just going to log in with my developer account. Oops, one second. Sometimes during that database sync thing, there's a brief moment where there is a uh, error in the test environment. It'll just take a moment for me to refresh this up again. There we go. Now let me just log in as the developer. Oops. My keyboard seems to not be working so well at the moment. Oh my goodness. All right, let's give that a try. It is hard to write a password when your keyboard is eating your input. Oh my goodness. All right, let's go to the articles page. We're on the test environment. We should see that new piece of content that Mr. Jenkins created on live. There we go, eat more oatmeal, which is perfect, but it has not been fixed yet because we have not imported configuration. So let's go into configuration. From configuration, we'll go back to that uh, synchronization page and we'll be able to see the difference. It'll just take a second. There we go. Now, if I go into configuration synchronization, we should see the change that we made back on the development environment. There we go. So there is one change uh, and we can view the differences if we want, but all we need to do is import all. Remember, Drupal is always reading from the database. So we have changed the code in dev. We deployed that up to the test environment. Drupal is still reading from the database, which has the incorrect information. So what we want to do is import the changes that we made in code. This is going to make it so that the database matches what we had in our code export from earlier. So what this should do is update that view to show all six articles instead of just the one. Now, after this completes, we'll be able to take a look at the uh, articles page and just verify that it is working correctly. Hey, there we go. So now we have six articles on this page alongside the new article that Mr. Jenkins made on live. Now, uh, at this point, I would Slack or create a JIRA ticket or something like that. I'd let Mr. Jenkins know that this is fixed and it's ready for his review in the test environment. Uh, after that, he would go through and verify that it's working and check it, give his thumbs up of approval, and we would deploy that to live. And hopefully we won't have any surprises because we've already had a chance to test it in our test environment. Now, the cool thing about this is that with configuration management and with this workflow, um, there's no surprises. This is the this is the most surprising part is deploying to test. So uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to hand the microphone back to David and we're going to continue on with the presentation. But just know that we have deployed it to test. The next step, of course, would be to deploy it to live to import or configuration there. But it is pretty much the same thing that we just did. So uh, one moment, I'm going to go ahead and go let uh, David know that it is time for him to come back on stage. One moment. All right, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, that was the live demo. Thank you to our guests, uh, Kyle and Mr. Jenkins. Um, so let's go ahead and continue. So there's just, there's just one, one more thing, really. Is, and the question that you might be asking yourself is, who actually broke that page? Right? Because we have version control, because this is all being tracked in version control, it means that we are able to go into Git and we can actually verify. We can check to see 
who is responsible for this mistake that happened on the website? Well, let's take a look. We can actually go into Git. We can look at the log and reference that particular file and see when it was changed, what the commit message was, and who is responsible. So let's take a look. If we open up our command line interface, which I happen to have right here, I have my Umami CFM uh, site open. I'm just going to CD into the place where configuration is actually saved. So CD sites, default, config. And then from here, if I do a git log dash p, and then the, uh, the, the, the actual file that's been changed, we have uh, views.view.featured. YAML. Uh, Sorry, I actually needed a space between there. Uh, so after running that, I can see that this happened by me. No big surprise there, of course, uh, back in July. So this has been broken for a while, which is very unfortunate for the folks at Umami Magazine. Uh, also, I can see that the commit message was temporary change to try and fix article spacing issues. So clearly this was a temporary change that was uh, had unexpected consequences because they didn't have automated testing set up. That is something that Mr. Jenkins is uh, gonna ask Kyle to take a look at in the future. But yeah, we can see exactly what changed, who changed this configuration and when that happened. So that's pretty cool to give that layer of uh, information to the configuration, the site building stage, not just the development stage. Uh, if you want more resources, there are things here. And again, uh, there, there are links, oops, there are links in the, uh, in the slides that I'll give you in, in just a moment. You can dig in deeper, learning more about these. You can get official training with configuration management as well if you want to learn more. But with that, we have three minutes left. So I'll switch to this slide. Uh, feel free to grab my slides. Um, just go to davidneedham.me slash DCEU2020. Uh, you can grab the slides from there. And yeah, I'll go ahead and take some questions. Thank you all very much. Um, I do see we have one question so far. Uh, let's see, it says, is the same kind of workflow applicable with the file composer.json for sites using composer? So we keep modules, installation, and version synchronized with configuration and all in one place. Uh, I believe so. Um, so the thing about using Composer is that you don't have all the module files there. You just have that composer.json, which kind of keeps track of the versions of the modules you're using and all that stuff. So yeah, I, I believe so. Um, I, I don't have as much experience using Composer with configuration management side by side. Um, so I, I'm not aware of any problems with that. I don't see why it wouldn't work. It should be pretty much the same thing. Uh, and if someone else, disagrees or has a, another opinion, feel free to throw that into the chat because that would be a good thing to share and a great thing for me to know as well. All right, I don't see any other questions. We have, uh, looks like a minute and a half left. Um, so I'll just go ahead and I guess end it here. Thank you all very much for attending the workshop. I, I hope it was uh, entertaining, but also educational. I hope you learned something and it was useful for your uh, kind of development as a Drupal site builder. Um, yeah, if you have any other questions, if you want to kind of screen share or if you want to jump on video with me and chat, you can go to the Pantheon booth after this. Um, I'm gonna be going straight to the Pantheon booth after this presentation. Uh, so you can go to, uh, go to the exhibition hall, go to Pantheon. There should be a button to join the group video. Uh, if you go there, I'll, I'll be there and uh, John might be there too. Uh, and so we can answer any questions you might have. All right, well, I think with that, we're, we're good to go. Thank you again very much. Thank you for the opportunity, uh, folks at DrupalCon Europe. Um, thank you very much. Have a great rest of your day.